We are at uh, the last but not least talk for today. Uh, after the Q&A, we will have a short closing session and then we will see you all tomorrow, same time, 8 a.m. PST. Now, our next presenter will tell us all about the Minecraft-like game he's writing in his own programming language. Okay, said this way is perhaps not the most flattering introduction of my friend Vodor, but what if I were to tell you that this is his first um, that his first successful programming language was made all the way back in 1991 on the Amiga and that he made a big community around his open source uh, UGC first person shooters a good 10 years before Minecraft. In fact, you may know his gaming work best if you have, like myself, some gray hair and used to write your own three fillers. Uh, as in the past decade or so, he moved to a small startup called Google to do uh, more boring things like inventing flat buffers. Um, in all seriousness, um, Woder is one of the rare minds in computer science to successfully bridge two realms and do so consistently over the decades. In his case, language and gaming. He will tell us a bit about his journey and what he learned along the way. Uh, I really hope to see some great discussions around this. So please, again, uh, join us on Discord to post questions for the live Q&A after the talk. Hello, everybody. Welcome to my talk. Scripting language, engine language, why not both? But first, a little bit about me. I am Wouter Van Ortmersen and I'm currently running my own little indie studio where we're building a game that is focused on giving gamers all the tools such that crafting your own world is almost as much fun as playing it. We're building this on some interesting programming language technology and an engine built on ray traced foxes. Before that, I was at Google working on flat buffers and general game and VR tech as well as WebAssembly and LLVM compiler work. I worked at a variety of game studios, such as Crytek, EA, Gearbox, as well as taught engine programming classes at a master's degree program for video game development. I made the open source Cube engine that did multiplayer voxel editing before it was cool. I've designed more programming languages than should be legal, including some popular ones way back on the Amiga platform. The theme of this talk is about the intersection of game engines and programming languages. I've spent my career building both, usually with one influencing the other extensively. I'm going to start with a whirlwind tour of past engine and language designs that may be interesting, then moving towards my latest engine where we see how the scripting language taking on a different role changes everything, mixed with other fun topics such as type inference, resource and memory management, performance, serialization, debugging, refactoring, and ray tracing. So yeah, programming languages. If you came to this conference wanting to learn about the hottest rendering pipelines, oops, wait, don't run away yet. We'll get back to that engine stuff eventually. Now, first a quick overview of some of the major language projects I've worked on, some of which involve engines and or games written in or for said language. With me, you can never quite tell which came first. So, First though, why did I spend so much of my career trying to invent new languages? If you had asked me 20 years ago, I would have claimed programming language design is the number one way to improve software engineering in general. Nowadays, I'm a little less delusional. I can see for many tasks, even very different languages can often be very close in terms of productivity or bug avoidance to the point that they are interchangeable. A lot of people nowadays appear to feel the downsides of fractured ecosystems outweigh any benefits. Maybe they're right. That said, I feel strongly that even if a new tool only makes something 1% better, if that is for a thing that you do 100 times per day, then every small fraction of improvement is worth it. And we can likely get bigger gains than that still. We're not going to arrive at new mainstream languages which have these advantages baked into them if no one is experimenting with them. And I've sacrificed my career to be that experimenter, just so you don't have to. 
Just kidding, I frankly can't even pinpoint why language design and implementation fascinates me, but boy does it ever and has so for a long time. It's kinda the ultimate in computer science nerdery all in one project. It's also why I like game engines, which is just a slightly different pile of computer science nerdery. Compilers are also the ultimate meta-optimization. You optimize code for all users of your language at once. To me, that is pretty fascinating. People like me who make things because it's exciting can end up building things no one has asked for. But they can also come up with some not great novel solutions just because they have the endless energy and passion for the topic. You decide which is the case here. And this image is from a YouTube video claiming that lobster is the best language name ever. First, Amiga E, all the way back from 91, and sadly still my most popular language ever. It was a procedural, functional, object-oriented language with a native code compiler written entirely in assembly language. I used assembly since that's what I was comfortable using at the time, since I was writing all these graphical demos in it. I made the compiler seriously small and fast, which back then people still cared about. I even sold it commercially for a while. Back then, all the Amiga magazines would have these multi-issue courses on the language. You see here a pile that I collected. I also used it myself to write everything for many years. See for example here my first texture mapped rate recasted racing game that I was working on back then. Then false, which is kind of only on this list because it's the granddad of languages like BrainFuck, um, an is an obfuscated programming language with a native code compiler in a single kilobyte. People actually managed to write games in this language with an output, with the output executable often a hundred times or so bigger than the compiler executable. Wild times. Then blah, which was a more academic language where stack frames and objects are the same interchangeable things. Next, Artapel for my PhD, a visual tree rewriting language that ran seamlessly distributed across as many network computers as you could hook up, because why not? And see, for example, on the right, how it computes a Mandelbrot really slowly and confusingly. Now more pragmatically, WOD-C was a programming language for Doom level design. I actually managed to make a good amount of maps with this that even ended up in Doom Megawads as they were called. I had an interest in game and graphics programming since my days of directly addressing the hardware and assembly on the Amiga, but Doom certainly intensified that, as I'm sure it did for a lot of people. First person perspective changed everything for me and I'm still not over it. This is certainly the beginning of a theme of trying to put the language in charge of the game in some kind of way. Next up is Sheep, my attempt at a system-wide scripting language for when I was working as a part of, the, of a team at Amiga to design a new operating system. One of my first languages to have a novel memory management system based on linear logic, which is compile time one owner. Sound familiar? And of course, more Mandelbrot. Cube was my engine that started as an exercise in simplicity and fun level design. With the first fully multiplayer capable engine in only 64K of compressed x86 code. Based on quadtrees and later octrees that contain deformable cubes in its cells, meaning you could shape the cube by sizing its edges. It didn't just have in-game editing, but multiplayer in-game level editing. Back then, players were begging me to make that part of the gameplay. I of course refused because level editing is obviously a separate thing from playing, right? I mean, who would want to mine or craft in a game? I mean, it sounds tedious to me. Anyway, it also contained CubeScript, the scripting language, entirely string-based started out as the smallest possible scripting language ever, like everything in the Cube engine designed around being crazy small and simple, but in the end became quite powerful, mostly through macro-like constructs. It ended up being used for absolutely everything, from config to UI and gameplay, 
and our unwieldy shader system. Successful because it was very accessible, most players could get started thinking they were just creating a configuration file. Cube was very successful as a community, with millions of downloads and probably one of the largest repositories of custom maps outside of its software games. It continues to today, with large Discord communities still organizing multiplayer events and making maps. It being open source from day one and having a really friendly editor probably helped giving it a long life. CryScript, for an early version of the CryEngine, which like many of my languages tried to innovate on memory management, this time with regions. Restructure, which was an ambitious program to refactor whole programs. No, not just the tools some IDEs give you, but rewriting the entire program, removing redundancies and introducing abstractions as needed, as well as removing unnecessary abstraction by inlining. Never did a rabbit hole go so deep. I was for a while seriously thinking I was solving programming in general, thinking the average programmer is simply incapable of writing properly refactored code, and a tool had to do it. It had me absorbed for years until I finally came to my senses and realized most programmers wouldn't want their code moving around in hard to follow ways on every edit. Implemented using a structural code editor that did everything on the fly, including type checking, and as the first example hints at, I wanted to make it suitable for games because of course. And so we finally arrive at my latest large language project, which by now is some 13 years in the making, Lobster. What started out as some experiment in language design, I wanted features designed for high refactorability, became a fully featured game programming language, since that's all I was using it for. It had many game-specific features and a better included game API, or unopinionated engine, if you will. It changed a lot over the years, gaining some very innovative type checking and memory management mechanisms. More on that later. I've personally used it as the basis of endless game and engine prototypes over the years. And now one of those recent engine prototypes, I am now building a game company around. Eek. Most of the prototypes centered around gameplay were 2D and probably not that interesting for this audience. But the main takeaway point is that having a language set up for game development, but not opinionated about a particular style of game is seriously productive for trying out all sorts of things. I could whip up a new game in a few hours just to see what a particular mechanic would be like. Not opinionated meaning it has no built-in concept of level, scene graph, game entities, but it's high level enough to easily add your own. An opinionated engine provides a lot of built-in functionality that is helpful for larger projects, but for simple things makes, made by a sim single programmer, uh, that can often get in your way and require a lot of setup just to get going. But before we get to that latest engine, let's see a few experiments that led up to it. A central theme was my goal to find a new rendering representation that could bypass the complexities of modern engines, yet could give pleasing and unique visuals. A lot of experiments were centered around trying to cache the results of ray tracing in view or even world space, and then reproject these samples as the camera moved. For example, the top left cached them in a cube map with the reprojection compute shader using Atomic Min to move the samples. Nobody had told me how hard filling the resulting holes would be, so the next experiment centered around caching them in a mesh instead with the mesh density set by the distance to the camera. Since there were no holes, it decoupled computing new samples and optimizing the mesh from the frame rate and camera movement, which seemed very promising, but in the end result was unimpressive visuals. Of course, I also experimented with caching SDFs, but somehow that didn't excite me as much as it does everyone else. The previous experiments were based on the assumption that you can't just ray trace every pixel of the screen every frame. This was way before RTX and whatnot. But then I decided to just try and make something that would use the simplest possible voxel structure and see what would happen. And the results surprised me. First, I did this on a per object basis, but then the thought of needing to go back to the horrors of traditional shadow maps led me to do it for the entire scene. First, I wanted every voxel to be unique 
So I wrote some courageous multi-threaded lossy voxel compressor that would merge voxel blocks as the scene changed or was generated. This was complicated and obviously produced artifacts. Then I went even simpler, using a simple octree of bricks. This was both stupidly simple, the entire rendering engine in single, single shader, looked great and unique, well, to me at least, and allowed me to render large worlds. I decided to roll with it rather than to continue to search for more advanced methods. Soon I had moving objects in the scene as well, giving me everything you'd need to make a simple game. And all the recent experiments you've heard of were written in Lobster, as just a bit of Lobster code and an embedded GLSL shader, often all in a single source code file. How does that become an engine? Well, that's what I've been working on. What started as a single file is now the basis of a game and a company with a team of six, of which three are programmers, hacking away at it. What does that look like? Drum roll. Just kidding, of course. But the first thing to say is that like a, like a lot of game engines, we get a lot of benefit from using different languages for different goals. But unlike other engines, we go about it a bit differently. Most engines have gigantic amount of C++. C++ that needs to be touched for every small change, and most of which is not needed to be in C++. Given that it's not speed sensitive, or does something with, with native APIs that other languages can't. I'm going to make a controversial statement and say that I bet that 90% of C++ in most modern engines can be classified as glue. By glue, I mean code that doesn't produce an end user effect directly, such as drawing a triangle, but is merely trying to dare to move data and control flow between the most essential parts. Then the scripting language, which is actually good at glue, only gets called upon in isolated gameplay events. It is hard in an existing code base to identify glue because everything appears to be doing something useful. But do this thought exercise. If you took a game written for a large AAA engine and had it re be rewritten such that only minimally produces exactly the visuals and the gameplay of that game, but nothing else, and was not usable as a general engine anymore, how much smaller would it be in code size? probably at least 10x. It would be very impractical to develop this way, but the point is, the amount of that glue that we need is affected by the engine structure and the language, and C++ is not great at glue. Here's what ours looks like. Most of the engine is written in the scripting language. This is not just write less stuff in C++. The crucial thing here is the inversion of control. The scripting language is the main program, and the C++ code is just a set of leaf functions. This allows all the glue to be in Lobster, and oh boy, is Lobster better at glue than C++. It produces much less of it, and it's a ton easier to refactor and manage. As it turns out, a lot of refactoring is about restructuring control flow, or call flow, and all ours is entirely in Lobster. This model is similar to, for example, how Python integrates native NumPy or machine learning libraries entirely driven from Python code and objects. And unlike how a scripting language like Lua in most engines gets to interact with objects that are actually owned by the engine. It is also different from other projects that want to replace C++, such as Rust, Zig, Nim, J, etc., which take a principled stance of wanting to replace 100% of C++. Here we're happy just replacing 90% of it with good enough performance for that 90% which results in possibly different language tr design trade-offs. It is also very different from things like Unity's scriptable, scriptable rendering pipeline as it allows the script code to set up a rendering pipeline which is then still managed and executed by C++. Here we put that entire rendering architecture in script defining the rendering pipeline, the scene graph, and all non-rendering parts of the engine as well. The C++ code is only the leaf nodes of the call graph, how to submit a script-owned GPU buffer to the API. I could talk about what our actual rendering pipeline looks like, but this being a ray-traced game, it is actually not, it's actually rather simple. Mostly a graph of compute shaders with buffers between them. 
This is not a novel rendering architecture. The point is that it's entirely in script and can easily be made specific to the game in question. And these improvements are just in terms of static code. Let's talk iteration. Lobster runs as a JIT by default outside of our shipping builds and has a startup time of some 0.1 seconds, even for mid-sized code bases. Our JIT is actually libtcc, which is a tiny in-memory single pass C compiler that compiles even faster than Lobster itself. Our C++ builds are tiny too, since we have much less of it. And since it's leaf code, nine out of 10 changes do not touch C++ at all. The above time is for a full rebuild. So our average time waiting for C++ to build may approximate zero at this point. To me, fast iteration is absolutely life-changing, not just in terms of being able to make quick progress, but also how much fun it makes development. It is hard to overcome the C++ link time or the JVM startup time, and every new order of magnitude faster affords new ways of iterating. Until something feels instant, you can still do better. You can find plenty of languages with good static typing and performance, and also plenty of languages with fast startup times, but sadly, the intersection is a bit empty. While I'm bragging, let's briefly mention load times. Um, because we have such quick build times, we've taken extra care to give all our assets, asset loading and octree construction code a lot of love. And our cold load times from code change to playing an actual level are some two seconds currently. It is a joy to work with. We only have hot reload for shaders currently, and we could probably have hot reload for gameplay code, but so far we haven't bothered because cold starts are so fast and it's very simple to maintain. We will actually eventually have a better separation of gameplay code that can be considered a mod, at which point we can also likely do hot reloads of that code to iterate even quicker. This requires slightly more planning because Lobster is a very static language, unlike a lot of scripting language. uh, uh, languages. The benefits of this inversion of control between script and engine go further than just a massive shift in where the glue code goes. It also means we put Lobster in control of memory and resource management, and C++ can just be dumb about it, allocating or deallocating resources on Lobster's request. The C++ code still deals with platform and API dependent resources, such as textures, and wraps those in convenient objects that Lobster is entirely in charge of the managing the lifetime of. It simplifies the C++ code yet further and makes it less likely to make resource and lifetime errors. Furthermore, code that doesn't have to manage resources can be written more in an immediate mode style. Call it one frame and not another, not having to worry whether initialization or shutdown was handled correctly. The game wants to go into a different mode, different screen, render a different world. No worries, the C++ code resources move along with it without any state change checking. As an example, when I first implemented multiplayer infrastructure, I wanted to boot up two entire copies of the game and engine state to be able to test two clients in picture in picture mode with no state sharing. Our Lobster game engine state owns everything down to the GPU buffers. So when I instantiated two copies of it, it just worked first time since the C++ code doesn't manage anything. How many traditional engines would run into troubles when you ask it to run two entirely separate copies of the engine the engine state in one program for the first time. Adding a second client for multiplayer is difficult in terms of resource management, but it didn't require much code. As an example of a different kind of large scale change where we changed the game session from containing one world and one player to several worlds, one for the game and one for each kind of editor we have, this required more refactoring in the lobster code because there is some state is shared between worlds, like all the art assets, but it still required no changes in C++. That just worked, took maybe a day of work. This kind of large scale engine refactoring is often unthinkable in C++, yet we do it regularly. C++ code can of course try to be defensive against changes, but architecting absolutely everything, assuming it must be possible to have more than one of them. But this comes at a high engineering overhead code complexity 
and of course more of that glue. In contrast, the lobster coat is already so simple and easy to move around that assuming we have just one of something is initially not a bad decision and speeds up development. We also don't pay the cost for supporting multiple of something when it's never needed. We can also have an engine that is more specialized to the type of game we're making as opposed to try and cater to everything because it's impossible to re-engineer later, giving further simplicity benefits. I expect if we ever make a second game based on this engine that is in a very different genre, we'll simply refactor a lot of the engine to fit that game's needs, throwing away unneeded functionality easily and thus making it easier to push further. The language was designed from day one for easy refactoring by allowing strong typing guarantees even in the absence of explicit types and having lots of lightweight abstraction features. The reason teams don't do this inversion is because they fear slower speed of the scripting language is going to paint them into a death by a thousand cuts corner when it comes to speed, and that is a legitimate concern. You may also think it doesn't scale to large teams. For both those reasons, the language needs to be fairly fast and strongly typed. The better it does at both those accounts, the more you can do in the language before you hit a wall. In our case, we are completely GPU limited, and most core physics and pathfinding functions are already in C++. We had a lobster-induced slowdown exactly twice. Once, where we were filling the entire octree block by block in lobster, which was then moved to C++ and still isn't fast enough there. It is responsible for about half of our loading time you saw. And a second time, when in our largest world sizes, we were spawning thousands of monsters that were not called in any way, all running AI, character animation, and rendering setup entirely in Lobster. Doing some modest distance attenuation fixed that. We haven't moved any code to C++ in months, and all our CPU bottlenecks, if any, are in C++. We're going to have to multi-thread it if we want it even faster. And Lobster being fast enough for almost all of our code is in using its development JIT mode. Shipping builds will use an optimizing compiler where users will enjoy an estimated three times faster Lobster code still, should that ever be necessary. Or rather, since we dev with the JIT, we are guaranteed no CPU bottlenecks in shipping builds, even for users on anemic laptop CPUs. Choosing an unproven language is of course a big risk that may not suit everyone but the language has been in development since 2010 and appears pretty stable. We find bugs, but they are rare. My point, however, is not that you should be using Lobster. You may be able to achieve the benefits of this inversion with a more mainstream language. Just everything in Lobster has been engineered for this purpose. Languages like, say, C Sharp, Go, or Kotlin are large and unwieldy, have game-unfriendly characteristics like garbage collection, and may not give a large enough simplicity or refactoring boost over C++. While truly simpler languages like Lua or Python often have dynamic typing or other features that make them unsuitable for being the main development language in a team. There's not a lot in between for some reason. Some other fun features that put Lobster in that sweet spot between a very static language and a scripting language. It has a monomorphic, flow-sensitive type inference and specialization. What that means is it will go further than most languages in doing type inference for you, even across complex chains of function calls, while ensuring that everything is statically typed and efficient. Lobster code often looks deceptively high level, but underneath is a pretty strict type system that does full null safety, for example, and is able to compile away inefficient constructs like function values and higher order functions down to more efficient handwritten equivalents. It can do the equivalent of if const expert in more tricky situations than C++, ignoring type errors in branches not taken, such as the example on the slide. On top of that, it has a compile time reference counting system, which uses the above powerful type inference infrastructure to be able to track and remove ownership at compile time. Unlike Rust, it is mostly an optimization, meaning um, whenever ownership is shared, it still has runtime reference count fallback, rather than erroring like Rust would do. End result, cheaper memory management for 95% of ref count operation without the user needing to annotate anything or worry about who owns what. 
We also have game-specific functionality. Trivially, Lobster has built-in support for n-dimensional vectors with a mostly GLSL-like syntax that are used everywhere. But it goes deeper with language features that have game-specific functionality, where the language is aware of frames. Much like C allows you to declare global variables only visible inside functions using static, we allow the same for class members that are only visible inside functions which would be useful also outside of games. But then we go further and allow class variables inside functions that are initialized whenever the last frame didn't execute the function. Essentially, they allow you to know what the value of something was the last frame, but specific to a particular object and with automatic reset. This is useful for all sorts of gameplay and animation features where progress needs to be tracked across frames. In some sense, such a feature can be seen as immediate mode for state. Generally, we focus on giving as much things an immediate mode API as possible, meaning APIs that automatically initialize and remove themselves depending on whether they are used in a frame or not. Besides things like Dear IMGUI, which already provides this, we found that if you combine this with other APIs written in a similar way, large parts of the code become effectively stateless with no code dedicated to its setup and cleanup. As it turns out, the hard part of state is not having it, but deciding when to not have it. Another hard part about state is that almost all game state is represented as absolute, either absolute, a point in time, or relative, like a derivative of the state or the delta with the last frame. If you look through game state and APIs, you'll see that programmers often arbitrarily provide one of the two, but not the other. Coupled with clumsy user code, trying to derive one from the other by doing your own tracking of absolute values over time or your own accumulation of delta values into an absolute value. Features like frame members above make it easy to have both by making the past frame available without you having to do any tracking. Generally, APIs and languages should make it easier for users to choose which one is relevant to them. Lobster comes with its own graphical debugger that allows full browsing and editing of all the game data structures and stack traces. In games, placing breakpoints is hard because you may have a bug of a monster getting stuck and now you need to find a place in the code that may represent that condition, place a breakpoint, and then go reproduce that condition. Instead, we have these lightweight breakpoints that during development are permanently available. So you can spot a monster being stuck and then just select from the UI that you want to break inside the monster update to see what is going on. And also coming full circle and using flat buffers that I designed for games some 10 years ago at Google for my own game, finally. A bit about the general development philosophy here, which includes trying to do things early, unique and specific, except when not. Early means as early as possible all the way in the pipeline from compile time to user. Later in the pipeline has tremendous cost in terms of speed, stability, and simplicity of features, which doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It means you should only be doing it when you're conscious of these choices and spend your let's make a dynamic budget only on things that really matter, unique selling points, etc. In case of doubt, do not be scared to do it early and lose generality. Games and engines derive a lot of character from being unique and specific. Both are a feedback cycle. Many late things require more late things through dependencies and lack of speed. Many early things allow more early things because the extra speed can allow, can allow you to build things from scratch that late technology needs to do incrementally. Incremental algorithms can be way more complicated in terms of state that needs to be managed but are required when doing it from scratch is too slow. We have a fully destructive world that you can still edit while playtesting and switching between them. The engine manages multiple worlds for these purposes, with some special purpose worlds like the group editor, shown here, or animation editors. Each of these worlds has their own local player and their own inventory, meaning editing feels intuitive because it uses the same player UI as the regular gameplay but you can have a dedicated tool and prefab set up for each mode. So this conference has rendering in a name, yet I've been talking your ears off about programming languages. What gives? 
Let me preface this by saying that even though I'm speaking at a rendering conference, I am, certainly compared to the other speakers, by no means a rendering expert. I just flip signs in GLSL until pretty pictures appear. That said, we are doing something somewhat novel in that there are a lot of games nowadays that use ray tracing in some way, even very innovative ones like Teardown that use it extensively, but almost none that use it for their primary ray. We have a ray casting function that goes to the entire static scene, which is an octree of bricks, and all the dynamic objects, currently a sphere tree of bricks likely to be replaced in the future, in a single traversal, and is used for primary, shadow, reflection, and auxiliary rays for our light volume. Presumably, not using ray tracing for primary rays has pragmatic performance reasons, but I started with it because I crave simplicity in the ever-expanding rendering pipeline and end up creating something that to me was surprisingly fast and stuck with it. How fast? Uh, we see the Steam Deck as our low end and that already runs near 60 at native res with many optimizations still to come. 4K gaming is in reach of uh, 3070 currently and 1080p can be done with all, most older hardware, including laptop GPUs. Why is it fast? Again, see the I'm not a rendering expert disclaimer, but from what I'm understanding, one of the cool things about our ray tracer is that it's purely iterative, which means no stacks of any kind, though we do use a parent pointer in the octree, which seems to allow this relatively complex code to have efficient occupancy. Also, generally rendering features have been kept simple. We have experimenting with, experimented with path tracing, just because we can, but don't expect to even ship that as an option. That said, we are a bit more resolution sensitive, meaning we either have to convince people gaming on 4K screens with older GPUs that they may need to be playing using an upscaling algorithm, or we'd have to cave in and add an optional forward pass to push the ray forward to the bricks. But I'm hoping we can manage not to do that. We currently render mid-sized worlds of about one by one kilometer in GPU memory without any sort of swapping or loading going on which may not sound like much space for a modern open world game, but with voxels you naturally have a bit denser, more compact world design, and we can fit many hours of, of gameplay in such spaces. We have ideas on how to further compress or swap data to make bigger worlds possible in the future if necessary. Now, since we only have a single primary light, the sun, we do all our secondary lights, bounces and volumetric fog and many other tricks using our light volume, which is very similar to a light propagating volume with currently three player centered cascades, one up at each frame. We are far from done with graphics, expect more to come. Finally, I think it's important to realize that the Minecraft generation will easily give up about 10x geometric detail just to gain a small amount of agency over the world. And it's this thinking that we apply in our decisions on how to structure the engine. Dynamic modifications of anything should never cause a longer frame. And that's all from me for now. Any fun questions? All right, and we are back. Perfect. Okay, so let's go to the audience questions. Um, first, uh, from Tian Liang Ning. Uh, is your assessment of C++ versus scripting language being good or glue impacted by whether people are using a data-oriented design approach or not? Hmm. I would say, well, first of all, big fan of data-oriented design approaches. Um, but in my mind, they're mostly valuable as an optimization technique in terms of a technique of better software engineering in terms of your engine. Um, certainly in C++, I don't think they're that valuable in the sense that like when I see any kind of ECS or similar system in C++, it tends to make the C++ code more complicated rather than less and require more setup code rather than less compared to the, you know, just do the dumb thing and allocate a bunch of objects and, and, and do whatever you do in the most basic case. Um, so I don't think it helps there. Um, I do think it has promise. I've experimented with programming languages that have a, a data-oriented design or ECS style built in to the, to the language. 
And I think that's kind of the way to go. If you're, if you're going to make an engine that has this inversion to bring your ECS into the language so that the language can make the ECS very ergonomic compared to uh, C++, you could have a major, major win in terms of uh, refactorability, I think. Cool. Um, I'll, I'll uh, selfishly take um, one of my questions because it, it plugs uh, very well later with an audience one. Um, I remember that um, Tim Sweeney uh, advocated, I think a decade ago, right? I remember this presentation was still in four thirds and in Comic Sans for core engine language. Sorry. My phone decided to connect to my ear pods. Uh, so uh, Tim Sweeney advocated a decade more ago for core engine language to be more productive and safe, even at the cost of some performance. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that this never happened uh, before Lobster successfully? Is that mostly because of tooling and legacy and things like that? Yeah, there's a lot. Of, I mean, I hinted at some of those in, in, in the talk. I think there's a lot of lot of reasons. I mean, it's a big step. It's, it's very scary. Um, it's very scary to depend as much on a, on a language. Personally, I am very much about like maximum performance, everything. So the idea that we're going to use a language and we're going to allocate a lot of objects and it's going to be garbage collected and it's going to slow the whole thing down. I mean, that's that's very scary and I would not want to do that. So it needs a particular kind of language to, to pull this off. Um, uh, tooling is not a big one. You know, as you saw, we have a debugger now. We're still... Mm -hmm. uh, we're still uh, not not perfect in terms of the developer experience that we still need to improve upon. So, um, yeah, uh, well, it's, a, it's a large effort. You see, like with you know, Tim Sweeney is now making the the verse verse language, and he now is a large enough company to put enough developers behind it to make this happen, basically. But if you're a small company like we are, then being able to you know do all the tools is is kind of difficult. Yeah, maybe if we have time, we can we can talk a little bit about that. Even if that, to my understanding, is more of a scripting language still, right? So not even what he was advocating yeah, before. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But this kind of like uh, the, the question I was mentioning from the audience, from uh, Bob uh, van der Werf and Bensby, uh, they were asking, can you tell us about the progress on the Lobster language server protocol? Yeah, so an external contributor is actually working on this, and we're making a, a, a language server protocol to make the experience of editing Lobster in, uh, in Visual Studio Code in particular uh, easier, and basically get like the usual type of dot, get your fields and definitions and, and that kind of stuff. So that is ongoing. Cannot make promises about how good that will be or when it will be finished, but uh, yeah. And now that more people are using it, we see the importance of that. Uh so also like from what I understand, now you have your basic debugger built in. Uh, do you have any plans for that uh, to like be able to like debug from Visual Studio Code and stuff like that? There's no plans for deb I mean, if someone makes it, it will be there and will be, <laughs> will, will be useful. Um, since Lobster is mostly used in a context where there is a graphic screen, we are able to use the already existing Angui integration. Um, we already had widgets to do like all basic lobster data type stuff like that. So it was actually quicker for us to make a debugger that way than using Visual Studio Code. Um, yeah, could could be done otherwise in the future. That's what we have for now. Very cool. I mean, would be even interesting to see what you push in your debugger because uh, you know, Visual Studio is still the state of the art in a way, which is kind of sad considering that that way of debugging originated decades ago. Right? Uh, anyway, going back to the audience uh, from Fabian uh, Huber, do you think there is a world where the C++ part of Lobster Engine is replaced by Jai or Rust or uh, another language of the same type? Uh, I've certainly thought about that. I've, you know, I've, I kind of really like Rust, and even though I've never been able to use it for anything. And the thought of just kind of going like, ha, just change all that C++ code into Rust code and my life will be slightly easier. Um, that has been very, very attractive, but it's still a fair bit of work. Um, there's not just our engine bindings, which could be easily translated into Rust, probably. The bigger part is the actual compiler that's also in C++. Um, mm -hmm. But if I ever rewrite that, large parts of the compiler are, again, not speed sensitive. We could rewrite the entire parser or type checker um, 
in lobster itself, for example. So, but Rust would certainly be an improvement or any of the other uh, cool new languages. So. Cool. Um, from Theodore Lincoln, uh, who is a buffler, the Nick, uh, does this introduce the issue uh, of designing true APIs? Um, okay. So each thing written in C++ needs to interact with Lobster, and the Lobster engine needs to have a nice developer UX. So I would imagine there's some additional development complexity that arises over a single language engine. Well, assuming that single language is not C or C++, you're going to need to generate bindings for all the APIs that you use, right? You need to at least have OpenGL or Vulkan bindings or, or something like that. And you could completely automate that. Um, but as we know, you know, something like Vulkan in particular is, is, is very low level. What we do is we expose to Lobster very, very high level operations that draw entire thing, create entire buffers, that kind of stuff typically. And those single API points, they will use like 10, 20 or 100 API points in like uh, OpenGL or in, in, in Vulkan or whatever. So even though we kind of have a double API, we simplify what we use in C++ so much towards Lobster that it's kind of worth it. Um, and having that extra abstraction layer, of course, makes it even easier to move stuff around in Lobster. If we had like, you know, a call for every bit of Vulkan in Lobster or whatever, then I imagine refactoring our, our, our engine might be more difficult, so. Cool. Um... Okay, there are a couple of questions regarding the ray tracing. Let me see if I can sort them together. Um, okay, from Scott Anderson, uh, you mentioned explicitly not using hardware ray tracing. Are there plans to adopt it? And do you foresee any issues given the dynamic nature of the game? So yeah, that's mostly a, a, an, an issue of having developer bandwidth in the sense that like, it'd be interesting to see if this can be made even faster using RTX or something like that. Uh, we just haven't tried it. And so far it's been very fast using just a compute shader. Uh, I'd like to try it. I just need to spend some time on it. Um, no idea. Okay. And uh, from Tian Ning, you mentioned path tracing methods are more resolution sensitive. Can you expand on that? And where are you drawing the line between path tracing versus ray tracing? No, I, that, those were separate issues. What I mentioned is that our general render is a little bit more resolution sensitive than a, than a Polygon engine would be. Um, and I also mentioned that we experiment with path tracing. So path tracing is not what we're doing in the, in, in the main engine uh, for sure at the moment. So uh, why is it more resolution sensitive? I guess we're do, just doing ray tracing. You does more work per pixel as you can kind of can imagine. Uh, we, we are navigating the entire scene, uh, both the dynamic and the static part on a per pixel basis. So that is somewhat expensive and, and doing multiple rays of that. Um, it's not crazy though. It's like on my personal computer, I render in 4K at, at good frame rates. It's, it seems fine. Just some people, if you have a Polygon engine, you can really just tone down your shaders and still get at native resolution on a, on a not so powerful GPU in, in 4K say, well, we, we just can't do that. So, very cool. Um, yeah, I believe that basically, if I remember what like you do, the primary rays, is the shadows are still in ray tracing or yes, or no? yeah, we do ray yeah. trace shadows, and um, yeah, yeah, I desperately wanted this. As I mentioned in the talk, I really do not like shadow maps. Um, and then I think that you like it looks like there is some kind of GI, but it's not ray traced at that point. Yes, so we have we have two systems. We have the primary rays for lighting, for shadows, for reflections, and then we have a secondary system, which is kind of like a light propagating volume that intermixes with that. So it's kind of needed to get all the secondary lights and all the kind of like GI style uh, effects. And that is still ongoing. That's still not not completely finished, but um, yeah. Very cool. Uh, I'll I'll interject another question from myself. Um, uh, and I think, I don't know if you, like, I, I know that Lobster has this uh, kind of hybrid uh, static dynamic uh, ref count memory management. And, and you mentioned that one big thing that you do is that you leave all the uh, kind of uh, resource side things to Lobster um, in, mm -hmm. in your game, in your engine. 
uh, now that you have built a uh, kind of game and resource management of it, like how much this um, static part, static optimization effectively of the ref count saves you? Like, is it practice mostly resolved by the static pass or is it more in the middle where you still like have to effectively do ref counting for a lot of objects? I have to admit, I haven't retested with our actual project like what percentage happens statically and what what happens dynamically uh, that figure like when i tested against like a complete volume of test code it was about 97 percent that we were able to optimize away statically um, mm. i believe it will be similar um you have things like things are still dynamic are typically stuff that sits in arrays and objects but those also change less often than the ones in local variables so it, it it should be very similar to what I tested before, but I haven't, so. Is this like comparable to what, uh, I don't know if you, if you like, you know, or, 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 or thing, but I think that Java does this escape time analysis to elide a lot of uh, dynamic allocations. Is it something like a similar thing or it's more powerful? It's than related, that? but it is more powerful. So what Java does is is much more local. We can actually do this over a large chain of function calls um in in ways that java cannot and same go actually does similar uh uh, uh escape analysis is called um mm -hmm. a couple of languages do this and yeah you can get a lot of benefits from doing this locally you can probably remove like 50 percent of reference counts by just doing a very simple local local analysis but we went a little bit further Okay, let's get to I think uh, another couple of questions from our audience. Um, so from Stan Rand, the engine and language seems to be mapped on top of OpenGL. Are you going to apply compatibility with something like Zinc or add in modern idioms? So that's a good question. I was expecting someone to go like, "Are you using OpenGL? Are you crazy?" So I've used OpenGL traditionally, and basically with the modern API landscape being such a mess in terms of cross-platform support, I've always just kind of waited like, okay, let's try to stick with OpenGL for another year, and someone is going to solve this mess and is going to have this wonderful you know, thing that's going to be cross-platform, and we can just rewrite all our stuff to this new thing, and we're going to be done. And for some reason, that's not happening. So uh, that's for all your rendering people out there, please. Uh, but the, because we, we don't solve messes, we create more messes. Yes. That's, not, that's not how it works. Um, so also, if, I remember that you have like a WSM backend, right? Like, so is that OpenGL like then translating to there? Say it again, what, what kind of backend? I, I think that Lobster also ge can generate like WebAssembly. Yeah, I have, I have to admit, I wrote a WebAssembly backend, uh, but one of the downsides of WebAssembly is it does not uh, support arbitrary branches or go-tos in its, in its code, and our backend was relying heavily on those. So it became kind of like a maintenance nightmare trying to trying to make emit code both, you know, uh, branchless and branch full in our backend. So now we generate WebAssembly by going through the regular backend, which then kind of regenerates that branchless structure later so there's no no more direct to WebAssembly, but we use the regular WebAssembly tool chain then. that was a fun experiment for a while cool and uh, we have a question from omar shabira are there any fundamental limitation of lobster compared to other utility languages for games fundamental limitations that sounds very generic um fundamental limitations I mean, it's not as fast as Rust. Um, I, I'm not sure. Compared to other scripting languages, I don't think so. Compared to other languages that are typically used for scripting, quote unquote, in game, I I, I believe we're we're like Lua, or whatever. We're we're ahead in most respects. Um, so I'm not sure what else that question could be asking for. Um, ah, I guess one current limitation is. It's kind of like an ahead of time compiled language. So we can't do a lot of dynamic stuff that some languages can. If you use JavaScript as a scripting language, you're going to generate new object types at runtime or load new code at runtime and just kind of all mix that up. It currently can't do that. There's ways in which we can support it in the future. We just haven't needed it yet. Um, but yeah, other than that, I can't really think of too big a limitations. Oh, and it uses Python style syntax. So that already. Uh, immediately uh, discounts like about 90% of programmers who uh, 
apparently hate that style of syntax. So, um, but yeah. yeah. Well, half of my code nowadays is in Python. I don't know what that says about me though. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, all right, I think uh, we can close it here. Like I, I was tempted to ask you uh, kind of an impression of, of this idea of verse and uh, the take it as towards a declarative function language, but I don't know if that discussion is maybe big and we won't move it over to Discord. Yeah, I, I can briefly say that. It's like, sure. um, I generally am extremely appreciative of what, what, what they're doing. Um, I've talked with Tim about languages like way, way, way back when and he's had these kind of ideas of like transactional memory and a bunch of other things that have gone into verse since like a long time ago. Um, it's pretty awesome to have a large company sponsor something like this. And so we can all see if this works out. Um, I do feel there's some of the aspects of verse are a little bit very experimental. And I'm very curious to see what, how that's gonna go with like the general game republic trying to script something. Um, but I'm excited to see it. It's in some sense, this is a much more uh, radical programming language design than what Lobster is. Lobster in that sense is like just trying to do like a whole bunch of current things really, really, really well. And the verse is trying to radically re-architect how we, how we script games in particular, you know, distributed ones. So very excited to see. Okay, very cool. Thank you again for your presentation. It was very entertaining. Cool. Thanks. Thank you all.